Welcome to McKill of United Church on this Sunday morning. I'm glad you're here. A special welcome to all those you might be visiting for the first time or come back from an extended trip away down south or other places. We're glad that you are here. Your presence makes us more as we gather as a spiritual community on a journey to be more present in our world with ourselves and each other. Uh, if you're able, would you join me in our call to worship? I invite you to read the bold. God within us, God for us, God ahead of us, let us experience you in our midst this morning. May we experience the spread of all the earth and cosmos. May your inner presence in everything awaken us to the flow of the Spirit. Let us wake up a little today so our eyes see beyond the surface, our, our ears hear the music of life anew. That we might hear, that we might see, that we might let go into the sacred moment, evolving and unfolding, here and now, with awe and wonder. Sometimes religious practice doctrine, or survival even, become more important than people and relationships. This is what the prophet Micah is suggesting in this well-known biblical passage. The temple worship of sacrifice was being emphasized to the exclusion of justice and kindness. Yet, if we are honest, justice is perhaps not our default operating system, and humility is not our second nature. What actions do the requirements of this reading call forth from you, from us, as we look into our neighborhoods and cities? And the reading is, With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before God with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil, Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? God has told you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? In Matthew, verse 5, 1 to 12, in the Gospel of Matthew, the Sermon on the Mount is the first public act of Jesus. And this first public act is a teaching. Jesus is a teacher in the Gospel of Matthew, and to be a disciple is to be a student or a learner in the beginning. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then Jesus began to speak and taught them saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. May the Holy Spirit bless our understanding and help us to live the truth we hear. Amen. And all these things will be added unto 
don't know about about you, but I've I've always been fascinated with the Beatitudes. Um, they're only in the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Luke, and they're quite they're quite in some ways different if you read them and give them their difference between the two. There are different focuses. Matthew is on the, the mountain, Luke is in the plains, and even how they phrase them, they're similar but different. But in Matthew, you know, the, well, both of them have the word blessing, and I think in our, in our society, blessing is still as important as back then. You know, we, we talk about blessings all the time. Uh, and blessing can mean happiness or wholeness too in, in the ancient languages. But here, Jesus is pointing us to a certain, the Jesus of Matthew, to a certain direction of how we can find blessings. Today, you know, when we think of blessings, what do we think of? Money, health, how we look, who likes us, um, uh, safety, security. Uh, power sometimes is a blessing for certain people, control. But when I think of the Beatitudes, they're not pointing us to these sorts of blessings. And as you heard in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus is a teacher. Uh, in some ways, he's also the, the new Moses. He goes to the first big act of uh, Jesus and Matthew is to go up a mountain just like Moses went up a mountain. It doesn't say he came down, but when he comes down, it's almost, I was counting, it's almost 10. But these new things, and in a way they're not morality. These sayings of Jesus are sayings that are, are, are not something that, they're actually spiritual practices. They're actually ways to live one's life. And so I want to start with the first one today and just stick with it, because it's the first. I think it leads into the, all the rest of them. But what is this poor in spirit? Blessed are those who poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What's that mean? What's it mean for our practical daily life? What's it mean for us to, to live that way? Well, poor in spirit, um, if we have the first slide, it, it can mean quite a few things. Now, poor, just the word poor, it's the first dot up there, and you can read ahead if you want, is poor in the ancient language is meant to devotedly hold fast to something as if you were poor for lack of it. I think of Terry Vogt's story of that, of that person. Uh, I mean, could you live on $200 a month just for your, you had somewhere to live. Could you live on $200 a month? That's poor for us. How about a dollar a day? Could you live on a dollar a day like a lot of the world lives? I'm trying to get, get us the feel of the energy of what poor means. Or just think, if you, your body can go basically th at least three days without water. So if you went on a water fast for three days, it would hurt, it would be some discomfort, but what would that first taste that first drop of water feel like on your tongue i don't know if you ever fasted like what if you fast for a day or two or given up chocolate for lent if you've done things like that or other things what is that that first taste of food like see i really have a lot of honor for the people that went through the depression uh, and World War II and uh, you know, refugees and other people who've gone through extreme poverty, uh, they really know what poor is. And then, then you just, when, when you've experienced a lack of something, and, and even people with love and other qualities, you just, you hang on to it. That's why people who went through the depression, they wash their plastic bags. You know, they, they hoard things. They, they keep every twist tie that off their bag of bread because they've experienced lack and, and, and you may use it for something else. So that's what poor. So it's, it's poor in spirit. And the word in Aramaic is rukha. Rukha. It's the word for spirit. And as you heard with the, it's the word for breath. 
It's the word for what moves, stirs, and animates and links everything to life. And so it's sort of like you cling on to what really gives life. That's what the first phrase, blessed are those who devotedly hold fast to what really animates all of life. Or in Aramaic, it's an idiom, like reigning cats and dogs, like our idiom. And the idiom is humble. So blessed are those who are humble. Now, in our English language, we often think humble is this, 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 this false not being ambitious or false being pri- proud or false vainglory. So to be humble is like, sort of like to put yourself down. Like it's not to recognize yourself as having inherent worth or goodness or there's something wrong with me. So humble we often see is, you know, humble is being a doormat where you just let anybody do anything to you or you don't, you don't say who you are. I, I know that someone down south is not very humble. That's the opposite of humble who's president in the United States. Or humble doesn't recognize that, uh, and even a deeper part of being humble is recognizing that, that when, when we're not humble, is that we're not, that we can do everything on our own, that we're not really interconnected. So the opposite of humble in our modern day word is to realize what science has shown us and what spirituality has known too is that the universe and all of us are interconnected. We're not this sep- we're not separate, but when we're not humble, we think we can it's all about us. It's 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 the that we're not we're not we don't need these connections. And also it's really interesting in, in Latin the word humble, just to play with this a little bit, is the same root as humus. And humble points the, the, the origins of our English word humble point us to finding the source. So in humus, that's why this picture of a seed is up here, is a seed just naturally knows that if it wants to grow, it has to find the source of life. And one of them is its root. That's also the root of humble rat. Its root goes into the humus. And humus is that part of the soil. It has all the nutrients. It has the minerals. It, it supports life. It's the source of life. So to be poor in spirit, um, it's really trying to tell us that it's this invitation to find what is the source of life? What are we going to cling to? How are we going to find that source? And it says when you do, you find the kingdom of heaven. So, I mean, what is this kingdom of heaven? I'm always a bit resident with these old words because there's so much baggage on them. It's like every time I say it, I feel I have to reclaim it in a positive way. Because kingdom, kingdom has been used as such a patriarchal word, a word of colonialism, a word of empire, a word of kings and queens and presidents and prime ministers. And, it's, and we've seen kingdom as this hierarchical thing where there's domination, where there's subjugation, and it's not about freedom and life at all. But you know, in the, in the original word kingdom, um, in the word that Jesus used was Aramaic, as you've heard me say before, is, is, is of this fruitful arm. And I, I pulled up this you know, arm and hammer from baking soda. And it is a more feminine figure, too, of the arm. I don't know if it has to be with a, something to bust apart. But, it, but kingdom is trying to point to that it's not about rules. It's not about regulations. It's not about dominations. Jesus, in the, the language, subverted it from, from the Roman Empire. It's about how there's this, this creativity, this coiled energy, this presence, and it's in everything. So the kingdom is, is not about rules and regulations. It's about potential. It's about imagination. It's about possibilities. And then heaven. Well, my God, excuse me heaven. What we've done with heaven as, uh, as a species is okay. But the way Jesus uses the word heaven and the way it's in the original language of Aramaic, heaven is not really about a meso- metaphysical place that's separate from our universe or even in another dimension um, is where we go when we die.
if you, at least in my belief, and we can have lots of beliefs here, when you read the Gospels, when Jesus used the word heaven most often, and when he talked about it, he wasn't talking about life after death. If you really read the Gospels, in my opinion, he wasn't going around talking all the time about what's going to happen to you when you die. I don't know. Do you see that when you read the words of Jesus? Most of the time he wasn't. He was talking about here and now in life. Hey, let's, let's find healing. Hey, let's find freedom. Hey, let's find the dignity or worth of who you are. Let's, let's find a different reality, a different imagination, a different way to live in the world. And heaven supports that. The word, the word uh, heaven could be used as sky in the scriptures, the literal sky where they believed there were holes in it and the rain came through. Or it could, it could have been used to mean the furthest extent of something, which is heading towards the infinite. But it comes from the Aramaic word sh, um, Shema. And it's really trying to say that, that it says that here, that it indicates that it, there's a sacred vibration that vibrates without limit through all the entire cosmos. I, you may have never thought of heaven that way before. There's a sacred vibration that vibrates without limit through the entire cosmos. And so when Jesus and others were using this word heaven, they were trying to say that all the manifested universe of the cosmos is one. That heaven points to the infinite without limit in the finite, here and now. Or say it a really simple way, heaven's already here. Heaven's already here. It's in everything, it's everywhere, and everything is sacred, and everything is one. But we may not see it. We may, that's what Jesus was trying to say, that, that it's already here. You don't have to be good. You don't have to be something. You don't have to have something. It's in you. It's in everything. It's everywhere. I don't know if that makes sense to you or not. I don't know if you're, are you following me? So this, this phrase is saying this, or put it another way, poor in spirit. Poor in spirit. What is, so if we're poor in spirit, then the kingdom of heaven is yours. It reminds me of a story, a, a story of a Zen story that sort of highlights this teaching in another way. A young seeker, um, keen, we can get rid of the slide, <laughs> A young seeker who's keen to um, become a student of a certain master goes to visit them, and the master invites them into their little hut, and they sit on little cushions, and the student just starts rambling on about all their spiritual experiences, about their past teachers, about their insights and skills, and all their pet philosophies, and the master just listens silently and begins to pour a cup of tea. Out of, out of a teapot. And the master pours and pours, and when the cup is overflowing, the master just keeps on pouring, and eventually the student notices what's going on and interrupts their monologue, which is sucking all the oxygen out of the room, and says, stop pouring, the cup is full. And the teacher says, yes, and so are you. How could I possibly teach you? See, that's the energy of this beatitude. Blessed are those who let go in the moment of everything, you know, just let go in the moment and find themselves in the source of life, in the flow of the moment, in the breath of the Spirit which is in everything. For you shall find this power and potential energy in you and everything. That's what it's trying to say. Or put it another way, this, uh, I, redis I rediscovered Mary Oliver a poem that I forgot over the weekend at the conference. Mary Oliver is an American poet. I, I'm particularly fond of her. She's very earthy. She's a mystic. She's a poet. Um, and uh, she's passed away. And just before she passed away, we were reminded this weekend of a, she was at a, I think it was in Oregon, 
there was hundreds of people there and she did her thing and everybody had clapped at the end and she said, I want to give three words of advice to young people, she said, particularly young people, because I'm old. And she, here was her three words of advice. The first one was, pay attention. That's poor in spirit. Another way to say it, pay attention. The second one she said was, be astonished. That's what happens when we pay attention. We are astonished. And the third one she said was, share your astonishment. That's the kingdom of heaven. And the poem, the poem that I was reminded of, which sort of, I think, brings us from an intellectual near cortex more into reality experiences at the river Clarion. She writes, I don't know who God is exactly, which I think is really truthful. I think that's really wise. I don't know who God is exactly, but I'll tell you this. I was sitting in the river named Clarion on a water-splashed stone, and all afternoon I listened to the voices of the river talking. Whenever the water struck a stone, it had something to say, and the water itself and even the mosses trailing under the water, and slowly, very slowly, it became clear to me what they were saying said the river, I'm part of holiness. And I too said the stone, and I too whispered the moss beneath the water. See, in this first part of the poem, she's pointing us to the kingdom of heaven. See the stones, the water, and the moss, and the butterflies, and the forests, and all this are shining with a vibration of sacredness, of luminosity, of awe and wonder, of, you could say, God's presence. And she goes on to say, I've, I've been to the river before a few times. Don't blame the river that nothing happened quickly. You don't hear such voices in an hour or a day. You don't hear them at all if selfhood has stuffed your ears and it's difficult to hear anything anyway through all the traffic and the ambition. If God exists, God isn't just butter and good luck. God's also the tick that killed my wonderful dog Luke, said the river. Imagine everything you can imagine, then keep on going. Imagine how the lily, who may also be part of God, would sing to you if it could sing, if you would pause to hear it. And how are you so certain anyway that it doesn't sing? If God exists, God isn't just churches and mathematics. God's the forest. God's the desert. God's the ice caps that are dying. God's the ghetto and the Museum of Fine Arts. God's Van Gogh and Allen Ginsberg and Robert Motherwell. God's the many desperate hands cleaning and preparing their weapons. God's every one of us potentially. The leaf of grass, the genius, the politician, the poet. And if this is true, isn't it something very important? Yes. It could be that I'm a tiny piece of God and each of you too, or at least of God's intention and God's hope, which is a delight beyond measure. I don't know how you get to suspect such an idea. I only know that the river kept singing. It wasn't a persuasion. It was all the river's own constant joy, which was better by far than a lecture, which was comfortable, exciting, unforgettable. Don't blame the river 
that nothing happening quickly. You don't hear such voices in an hour or a day. You don't hear them at all if selfhood has stuffed your ears. It's difficult to hear anything anyway through all the traffic, the ambition. Said the river, I'm part of holiness. I too said the stone, and I too whispered the moth between the, the water. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Amen. I don't know if you heard this in part of the explanation or coming through intuitively, but heaven's not static. Heaven is an ongoing, unfolding reality. So as we go from here, may we open ourselves to how the rocks, the sky, the people in our lives, the trees, even our institutions, the places we work are all speaking to us, inviting us into a life that we can't create unless we let go into it. For God is in it, God is around it, God is with us, and God is ahead of us. Amen. Thank you.